Lyndon Johnson. All the third-year girls were assembled on the main playing field to practice for the opening ceremony of the National Athletic Meet. Supervising them was the war widow, Fumi Chan. Instructors at driving schools are the worst example of it, but all teachers get off on using their positions to intimidate the people in their charge. That's their way of trying to fill up the voids in their own lives. Dark, lonely lives create sadistic teachers. You there, you three girls. There aren't any boys watching you. The only reason you're not lifting your legs high enough is because you're worried about how you look. Nobody's looking at your silly legs. Lift them higher. Fumi Chand was shouting through a bullhorn. Adama and I were in low spirits in spite of the fact that we were gazing down on a sea of 17-year-old girls, about 300 of them altogether. The principal was going to announce a punishment the following day. Lady Jane and Anne Margaret's idea of organizing a petition had never got off the ground. The school authorities had got wind that something was up and applied pressure before anything could happen. After summer school two days before, I'd been discussing Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck with Adama and some other friends. We were trying to decide which of them could play faster, then which could run faster, which could eat faster, and so on. I said I bet that even when Janice Joplin farted, it came out sounding raspy, and everybody laughed. Then one guy suddenly stopped laughing and pointed at the entrance to the classroom, and we all fell silent. An angel was framed in the doorway, looking in our direction. Here's Aki-san, do you have a minute? She said, lowering her eyes. I floated toward her, suppressing an urge to start singing, My Little Butterfly. The angel stepped out into the hallway, leaned weakly against the wall with her hands behind her back, and looked at me with her head slightly bowed. I'd do anything, I thought, even march off to war, to be the focus of those eyes. Here's Aki-san, I... The angel spoke in a tiny voice. To hear her, I had to move her closer, close enough to smell her shampoo. I went into a sort of trance, gazing at the tiny beads of perspiration on her forehead, the fine wrinkles on her pink lips, and the flutter of her long eyelashes, wondering what it would be like to kiss that lovely oval face. The others were in the classroom doorway, peering out at us. Adama was grinning. Another guy flashed an obscene gesture, making a fist and poking his finger inside. Shall we go, like, to the library or someplace? I suggested. This is fine, she said. The thing is, well, Yumi Chan and I, and some other friends, we were going to start a petition, but our teacher said he wanted to see us, and, well, I'm so embarrassed, I didn't think I'd be able to tell you this but I know it would keep bothering me if I didn't, so I want to apologize because I saw it all. The teachers had threatened her. Talk about sadistic. I could imagine exactly how they'd gone about it. Their methods were basically the same as the ones the cops and the secret police used. The entire system was on their side. What's your problem? Let's hear it. Living in a free and peaceful country like this, Going to a school with the best college entrance results in the prefecture, getting on with your studies to help you prepare for the future. What have you got to complain about? This would have been their line of attack. I'm sorry. She was biting her lower lip, unable to forget, presumably, the way they'd bullied her. I could have murdered them for this. The only thing that turned those bastards on was stability. Getting into college. Getting a job, getting married, all their arguments were based on the premise that these things alone could lead to happiness. And it wasn't easy to deny a premise like that, at least for high school kids who hadn't yet found any real identity of their own. You're in class C, aren't you? I said. She nodded. Who's in charge of it? Shimizu. Mr. Shimizu, yes. Shimizu was the nasty bastard with the pointed chin whose profile looked like a crescent moon. I started doing an imitation of him. Matsui, what on earth are you up to? A. How can you want anything to do with that slobby as a key? A. You'd better think this over carefully. A. Shimizu had graduated from the Department of Japanese Literature at Saga University, 
the drabist department in the drabist university in japan saga prefecture had a fountain of seven colors in front of its capital building the ruins of an old castle and about a million miles of nothing but rice paddies it was hard to find a decent bowl of noodles or a woman under 90 anywhere in the area no one can tell me a guy who studied Japanese literature in a dismal place like that had any right to say anything at all to a brave and beautiful girl like Kazuko Matsui. My imitation of Shimizu wasn't very good, but she covered her mouth with her hand and giggled. Oh, I almost forgot, I said. Wait here a minute. I went back into the classroom and whispered to a guy named Ezaki, whose father ran a chain of beauty parlors that I wanted to borrow the record he'd just shown me. As Aki frowned and said, but, 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 no buts, asshole, just hand it over, I said and glared at him till he opened his bag and pulled out his brand new copy of Cheap Thrills. But I haven't even listened to it yet, he moaned. I ignored him and ran back to where the angel was standing. Adama was telling as Aki, forget it, man, let it go. When Ken's like this, it wouldn't matter if you were a cop, or a teacher, he'd walk off with the thing anyway. It's fate, man, let it go. You like Janice Joplin? I asked her. Oh, I know this record. The lady with the husky voice, right? Yeth, it's a good one. The only singers I know much about are the ones who came out of folk Dylan, Donovan, Baez, people like that. But I know this record. Summertime is on it, right? Lady Jane was a sweetheart. She didn't even mention Simon and Garfunkel, whose record I'd promised to give her and still hadn't produced. It's for you. Look, don't worry about the petition. I don't think we're going to be expelled anyway. This hasn't been opened. You haven't even listened to it yet, have you? Doesn't matter. I am going to be under house arrest or suspended or whatever, so I'll have plenty of time on my hands. I'll listen to it then. I stared out the whole window out the mountains in the distance, wearing what I hoped looked like a lonely smile. Lady Jane still had her head bowed slightly and was peering at me from under her eyelashes. When I saw the look in her eyes I knew I'd pulled it off, and I felt like dancing up and down the hallway. The angel left turning to look back at me several times as she walked away. Joining my friends again, I found Ezaki muttering darkly about people who only thought about themselves, but Adama said, Way to go, man. You played it perfectly. Now, with the drive to save us from expulsion having fizzled out, all we could do was wait for the principal's verdict. I wonder why watching this stuff makes me so sick, Adama said about the scene below where girls were running up and down the chalk lines and jumping around in time to the music. I'd never seen Adama looking this edgy before, he was usually so cool-headed and laid-back. He never showed any anger or disgust or sadness in front of other people. It's true he came from a coal-mining town in the middle of nowhere, but his father had a job in management and his mother was from a good family and had graduated from higher school. Adama grew up with all the love and material comforts a kid could ask for. He'd even taken organ lessons till the age of five, something that in the world of coal miners practically qualified him as a member of the aristocracy. This Adama of ours was really down now, though. The decision about our punishment must have been weighing pretty heavily on him. Fumi-chan's shrill voice, no, no, no. How many times do I have to tell you? grated on her ears. Blue and red veins stood out on her scrawny neck, and she was jiggling her ass in exasperation. What right did someone like that have to act so high and mighty? I didn't need an armor to tell me how sickening it was. I already felt like puking. There were, admittedly, some grotesque specimens among them, but to see 17-year-old bodies being ordered around was disgusting. Seventeen-year-old bodies weren't put on earth to be dressed in colorless gym clothes and forced to march around in some pre-arranged pattern. A few of them looked like hippos, it's true, but most seventeen-year-old bodies, with their smooth, elastic flesh, were designed to go running along some seashore playing tag with the waves and shouting with glee. 
So it wasn't only the verdict, just one day away now, that was getting us down. Watching the girls practice their routines was depressing, too. Just to see people being bullied into doing things was a bummer. Neither of my parents mentioned the punishment question during dinner. When the meal was over, I went outside in my yukata to set off fireworks with my little sister. She told me she was going to invite a classmate she called Torigai-san over to our house soon. Torigai-san was half American and strangely sexy for a sixth grader. I was always after my sister to introduce me to her. The reason she remembered and brought it up now was that she somehow must have sensed, in spite of my attempts to fool around and be cheerful, how low I was really feeling. My father was standing on the veranda watching us. He stepped down into the garden in his bare feet and said, let me give it a try. He took three sparklers in one hand, lit them, and waved them around in a circle. My sister clapped her hands, saying it was beautiful. Ken, about tomorrow, he said. I was busy painting a mental picture of Torigai San's blue eyes and budding breasts and didn't realize at first that he was referring to the announcement. I'm not going with you. I'll ask your mother to go along. If I went, you know, it could end up in a fight. This was no surprise. Whenever the school summoned my parents, it was always my mother who showed up. I preferred it that way, too. I didn't want to see my father standing beside me apologizing for something I'd done. Look them in the eye, he said. When the principal's dressing you down, don't look away or bow your head. I don't want you groveling to those people. There's no reason to swagger, but you don't need to be obsequious, either. It's not as if you killed anybody or held someone up or raped them or something. You believed in what you were doing, and now you've got to take the consequences. I felt airs brimming up. Ever since the bust, we'd been under constant attack by adults. My father was the first to offer any sort of encouragement. If the revolution comes, you boys could end up being heroes, and the principal could be the one hanging from a rope. That's the way these things go. He started waving the sparklers around again. Sparklers burn themselves out in no time at all. But they're beautiful. This was the first time I'd ever passed through a school gate with my mother at my side. Even at elementary school, it had been my grandfather who accompanied me to the opening ceremony. My parents couldn't go because they were both teaching. On the way in, we met Adam's mother. She was tall, with features a lot like Adam's but more firmly molded. My mother bowed to her, saying, I don't know how to apologize for all the trouble my son has caused you. I pulled her aside and whispered, what the hell are you doing? You don't have to apologize to Adam's mother. Her reply was that even as a little boy, I was always the ringleader. It's become part of your character, she said. Adam's mother looked at me with eyes that said so this is the boy who led my dear little Tardashi astray, but I smiled and gave her a cheerful, hello. I'm Ken Yuzaki. That was part of my character, too. The principal's ruling was indefinite confinement at home. Indefinite, of course, doesn't mean forever, he told us. The period of time will be determined according to the extent to which you are judged to have shown regret for your behavior. Your graduation and admission to college depend on this, so we strongly advise you to avoid any further lapses and hope that both you and your parents will give some serious thought to the reasons for this situation. He wasn't expelled, my mother told my father over the phone, tears running down her face. The word confinement made me think of solitary confinement, which was pretty depressing, but the realization that our punishment actually meant I could ditch school without even being sneaky about it cheered me up a lot. As we were walking back to the front gate, Yuji Shiro Kushi, the head greaser, Stuck his head out the window of a classroom in the middle of a supplementary lecture and shouted, Ken Yan. Adama? What happened? My mother got all flustered and flapped about in front of me, telling me to behave myself, but I ignored her and shouted back in a voice that echoed all around the courtyard. We didn't get expelled. We're confined to our homes. The members of my band, and the kids in our class, 
and Masutebe's supporters in the second year, and Shiro Kush's Gree underlings, and, 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 and Kazuko Matsui, all looked out the windows of their various rooms and waved. I waved back to Lady Jane. Confinement at home technically meant that you weren't supposed to step outside your house at all, but since that was likely to drive anyone nuts and undermine the rehabilitation process, we were allowed a minimum of freedom referred to as neighborhood outings. I didn't miss anything much. I couldn't go to any movies or jazz cafes, of course, but my house wasn't far from the center of town, so I managed to keep myself amused, sucking popsicles and playing with our dog in the park and the area near the base, visiting bookstores and record shops, spying on the house where the groupies tangled with their sailor boys, and meeting my sister's friend Tori Gaisan. Adam's situation was hell compared to mine. He'd had to leave his boarding house and move back home. The coal mines were on the verge of closing down because of an economic slump, and the place was practically a ghost town. They had a shoe store, a dry goods store, a stationery store, and a clothing store, and that was about it. Just about the only things in the clothing store were white cotton socks. The stationery store had nothing but rag paper. There was no instant curry in the dry goods store, and all the shoe store had in stock were split-toed canvas work shows. Rumors that the mines were to be closed had been circulating for a couple of years now, and people were leaving in droves. All you saw on the streets were shuffling bands of old geezers who couldn't have moved away even if they'd wanted to. You could hardly expect a 17-year-old kid who'd learned about Led Zeppelin and Jean Jean and Doggy Style to be happy about being stuck in a town like that. I, however, was so bubbly and so eager to put on my goody-goody act for the teachers who came to check up on me that more than once my father shook his head and asked me where I'd learned to be such a cunning little bastard. I'd serve them a glass of cold barley tea and smile and chatter away things that had armor, apparently, found it hard to do. They make me sick. I don't know how many times he told me this over the phone. All he did was get into arguments with his supervisors. They make me sick. Come on, man. Don't get so uptight. Ken, they all tell me you're really sorry about what we did. That true. It's just a pose, man. A pose. Yes. What sort of pose is that? Huh? Where's your sense of shame? What would Che have said? Look, man, take it easy, will you? Ken, what about the festival? We'll do it. You finish the script? Almost. Hurry up and send it to me. I'll start getting the stuff we need together. Whatever I can find up here, at least. What's that likely to be? Work shows. I don't think we're gonna need any slag heaps, either. A Dharma in confinement didn't appreciate jokes like this. He slammed the phone down. I called him right back and apologized. Hey, I'm sorry. Don't be so touchy, man. I'll finish the script soon and mail it to you, I promise. And listen, I was thinking about the opening for the festival, I mean. Remember that girl we met at Boulevard? Mina Gayama, the one from Junwa? We'll have her wearing a negligee and holding a candle in one hand, and the musical be Bark, the Brandenburg Concerto No. 3, C, and she'll have an axe in her other hand, and up on the stage there'll be big plywood boards with pictures of Northern High Teachers and the Prime Minister and Lyndon Johnson, and she'll start hacking away at them with her axe. Pretty cool, eh? This restored Adam's spirits a little. The festival was the only thing that was keeping him going. I knew how he felt. With the barricade now behind us, we were all looking forward to the next celebration.